Don't Move a Muscle, the podcast is starting. Hello and welcome to Podtrificus Totalis, a new Harry Potter read-along podcast. Uh, Your host for this podcast will be me, Cassie. And me, Joe. With this podcast, we're aiming to basically share our love of the Harry Potter series with each other and whoever deigns to listen to this podcast. So we're going to be going through the series chapter by chapter, book by book, until we reach the end or we run out of steam. No, hopefully we'll reach the end. Hopefully. Yeah, I'm intending to. (laughs) Might take a while. It will. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we haven't quite figured out our release schedule yet, but depending on what that is and... If we're going chapter by chapter, this could potentially be a several years venture. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see how that turns out. Our policy on spoilers for this podcast, uh, like I said, we're going to be discussing it chapter by chapter. But we both have read the series before and we'll get into our experiences with the series in a little bit. But uh, we both have read the series before. So we're bringing that knowledge of what happens later on into this discussion, of course. But we're going to try to limit ourselves to the chapter at hand. Yeah, so if you're just reading it along with us, um, you won't, well, hopefully you won't have anything spoiled. Or anything really, like, big spoiled for you. I mean, in my notes for this chapter, I have, like, suggestions to, like, oh, well, you know, we learn later on more about this, but in this chapter, you know, we're going to try to limit it to the chapter at hand, like we've said. Um, so we hope that you'll at best read along with us, or at least share in the experience of the awesome series, regardless of your experience level with the series. We're assuming that uh, 20 years out from the release of Philosopher's Stone and with Harry Potter as part of kind of the cultural zeitgeist now, um, that you at least know the basic structure of this, um, that you have some awareness of the movies or books as you're entering this podcast. Otherwise, why are you listening to a Harry Potter podcast? But, you know, if you're new to the series, we think that there'll be something here for you without it being too terrible for you in terms of spoilers. Uh, So we do think we should start by um, talking about our experience levels with the books. Um, I have been reading the Harry Potter series since I was a child. Um, Like most people in this generation, I was introduced to them at a very young age. Uh, I think I read the first book when I was six or seven. Uh, Actually, I never did read the first book. Well, I did read it later on, but um, I started with the second book because I watched the uh, first movie, which came out in 2001. That sounds right. I want to say. Yeah, so I watched the first movie and then I read the second book and eventually I looped back around and read the first book. But yeah, so I started reading them when I was six or seven in seventh grade in second grade. Yeah, and it's just been a love of mine ever since then. I read them obsessively as a child um, and just kept rereading them because the entire series was not out at that point. Um, and even when the entire series was out, I kept rereading them. And uh, it's just been one of those things that if somebody mentions it, you know, you can launch into that huge discussion and that I just feel the need to share that obsession with other people. Which brings us to Joe. I... Uh, watched all the movies uh, well before I read the books. Um, I read them for the first time last year. A um, year or two ago. I don't... Yeah. Time is year and a half complicated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this will only be my second time reading them through. Uh, but I love the movies and they make a lot more sense now with the books. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think that the second read through of the Harry Potter books is a lot of fun. I mean, granted, you were coming into it with already an awareness of, um, you know, the major plot points and everything. But I feel like the second read through, you're really picking up on things that you maybe didn't pick up on before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's a series that bears rereading very, very well. Some books, once you know what's going to happen, that initial like excitement and shock value is gone. And then it's functionally meaningless to you. But the Harry Potter series is really rich. And there's no better way to discover that than by painstakingly and obsessively reading it chapter by chapter. (laughs) Which brings us to chapter one, The Boy Who Lived. So obviously we're going to be hitting on the plot details of each chapter. We'll provide a summary of each chapter before we go. Um, I am also going to be pulling information from a book I've had since before Order of the Phoenix, the book came out. It's called The Ultimate Unofficial Guide to the Mysteries of Harry Potter. I bought it as a wee child. Well, I didn't buy it because I didn't have money then because I was a child. Um, But I bought it as a child. I found it in Borders Bookstore, which already dates it. (laughs) Um, And it goes through each chapter and just picks out little things, adds little details um, that 
people like me would find interesting. It's, uh, like it says in the title, an unofficial guide. It was published by a fan under the Wizarding World Press. I'm pretty sure it's a pseudonym because it says that the author's name is Galadriel Waters. So probably not her real name. I've been unable to find anything about this person that isn't related to this book. I would love to find Gladriel <laughs> Waters one day, though, because I definitely credit this book with um, kind of my love of literature and like slowly and painstakingly reading literature and focusing it on details and researching it because I just find it fascinating. But yeah, it's an awesome book. Um, I checked earlier and I saw some copies on eBay, so I recommend picking it up even if it only goes through Goblet of Fire. Yeah, so we're going to be pulling some details from there. And uh, I'll, of course credit Gladriel <laughs> when we uh, do that, uh, which I love because it makes me feel like I'm, you know, going to Lothal Orient to consult Gladriel rather than just opening this old tattered book. <laughs> All right. So uh, like I said, we're going to be talking about chapter one, The Boy Who Lived, and we're going to give Joe the floor to provide a summary of the chapter for us. Okay. So it focuses on Mr. and Mrs. Dursley, uh, mostly Mr. Dursley, who goes to work at a drill factory and here's some weird stuff from some weirdly dressed people about the potters. Uh, he goes home, checks out the news, and there have been owls and shooting stars. So he talks to Petunia, Mrs. Dursley, about her sister and her sister's son. Then we get to see Dumbledore arrive and talk to the tabby cat that's been hanging out around number four Privet Drive, who turns out to be McGonagall. Uh, Hagrid shows up and drops off little Harry, and they leave him on a doorstep overnight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is some questionable decision making. Um, we'll definitely get to that. So the easiest place to start is the beginning. I really wanted to read uh, the first few lines of the chapter just for reasons. Uh, and they read, Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. I think that that is such a fantastic opening. One thing that I think uh, Rowling does so well is introduce characters. Um, I especially love Hermione's introduction in a later chapter. I think that she has a talent for just cutting right to the heart of who they are without saying, Mr. and Mrs. Dursley were very, like, ignorant and prim and proper people. She just she has such a way of, like, working with language in this fun way. Mm -hmm. I just love that opening line. Uh, yeah, I love those first two lines. Yeah. They're very memorable. They are. I, they are. Yeah, I remember always being told, uh, <laughs> like in school, that if your, your first two lines got to say something gripping so yeah. that your audience wants to keep the reading. The attention grabber. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially because it, it presents that stranger mysterious thing, which is... I, a nice little thing that Rowling does, and we'll get to that at the end, how she moves you from kind of the real and the grounded thing to the magical. Yeah. I also found the description of um, Petunia really funny. Uh, it says that she had nearly twice the usual amount of neck, which came in very useful as she spent so much of her time craning over garden fences, spying on the neighbors, which I think is just a hilarious image. Mm -hmm. It's a great image, too, because it really just puts in your head like the this weirdo family. Yeah, it gives you the tip, the typical, uh, what is it, Meet the Smiths? or the Keeping John up with the Joneses? Keep, yeah, Keeping up with the Joneses. The Smiths. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, always spying on the neighbors, seeing what they've got. And yeah, yeah. Their entertainment is other people. To consult the ultimate unofficial guide to the mysteries of Harry Potter a little bit, they break down the uh, characters' names really well. Um, so I have some points here about Petunia. Petunias represent anger and resentment, and we see a pattern of J.K. Rowling kind of naming her characters after um, flowers really often. So Petunia's ang uh, Petunia, anger and resentment. Lily, on the other hand, who's of course Harry's mother and Petunia's sister, um, represents purity or fragility traditionally. To what level J.K. Rowling intended those connections, we don't really know. I did find a note from J.K. Rowling uh, that she chose the name Petunia because as a child, when she played make-believe with her sister, she would uh, give the name Petunia to unpleasant, mean female characters for some reason. <laughs> like, that was just her go-to name for Petunia, so I guess when creating this character, she's like, well... It's got to no, be just keep the trend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I thought that was a cute little detail. Like, why the name Petunia? <laughs> Who knows what led her to that uh, as a child? But I, I like that little story. Um, she said that the name Vernon didn't have any like particular story behind it. Just she said it sounds like an unpleasant name. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, it leaves a weird taste in your mouth. It does, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of names and referring to things, Vernon at one point refers to Dudley as Little Tyke. That bothered me. Made me think that the Dursleys are probably the type to say boys will be boys. Yeah, probably. But I mean, you kind of have to if you've got that son. I mean, you don't have to. But that if you kind of implies that, that Dudley son. just dropped out of the sky like that. Effort went into making him. Well, at that this point, way. he's maybe a year old. Yeah. So he's just a problem child right now. He's definitely going to get worse. Okay, but it's their fault he's a problem child. Not at that young. Yes. Parenting is important. Well, yeah, but at that age, these aren't like instilled values or actions. This is just, you know, some children behave behave worse. Okay, but McGonagall says later on that she watched Dudley like screaming and kicking Petunia up and down the street asking for candy. Like that's not normal child behavior. No, it's but definitely like, being encouraged. To stand there and rustle his hair and be like, oh, little tyke, boys will be boys. That's encouraging the behavior. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I hate I hate boys will be boys. No, I I completely agree. I don't with that, like that. But <laughs> I think he's too young for that to no. really matter. Mm, no, I think it matters. It matters the way your parents talk to you and like refer to you and stuff and how they react to your your behavior. So if you're being a little jerk and your father says, "Oh, little tyke," that's it's implicitly accepting that behavior. Yeah, I guess. But again, he's one. <sighs> <laughs> that's, all, that's all I'm saying. About. Like older, that's that's completely reasonable. But as a one year old, but you're still you're conscious of what's going on around you. I couldn't say. I don't remember when I was one. All right. Okay. All right. That's enough. <laughs> At one point, Vernon walks by McGonagall sitting on the ledge, which I think is such a McGonagall move to just like plant yourself on that ledge and stare at these people all day. Mm. Um, he walks past a cat reading a map and just accepts it for two seconds before he well no he says like wrong. hey that's kind of weird but that mcgonagall sat there as a cat and read a map is just simultaneously like a pretty careless and a pretty ballsy move because <laughs> on one level it's like oh maybe she just didn't think that anybody would notice but on another level she would be like they're too stupid to think there's anything wrong here and at that point she was at their house and her mindset must have been this can't be the place yeah <laughs> Yeah, I love McGonagall. McGonagall is definitely one of my favorite characters. Yeah, she's great. Um, so Vernon goes to work, like you said, and um, he sells drills. You said he works at a drill factory, but he's a salesman. Oh, did I say drill factory? Yeah, he's yeah, a he salesman. Yeah, he sells drills. Yeah. Who sells drills? I don't Are they big, like, construction drills? No, or I just assumed, like, handheld like, hand drills? Held, like, it's never specified, but that was my guess, the handheld drills. Yeah. So... Maybe, like maybe large orders of drills, like for a company. I, what company needs large orders? I don't know. Construction company. I just I guess. this was the first time I ever sat down and I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's. I questioned that from the beginning, but there was no answer. I mean, and there doesn't need to be an answer because that's just such a minute little detail. But I don't know. I have never heard of a drill salesman. Yeah, the only important part is eh, he's a salesman. Yeah. Yeah. Which definitely has certain connotations to it. Okay, uh, the next quote that I highlighted uh, was a, another one about Mr. Dursley being at work. It says, Mr. Dursley sat frozen in his armchair, shooting stars all over Britain, owls flying by daylight, mysterious people in cloaks all over the place, and a whisper, a whisper about the potters. I highlighted that because I think that J.K. Rowling wrote that to put on the inside of a dust jacket. <laughs> <laughs> I'm positive that, like, you know, you open the book and there's that quote and then a blurb. That's yeah. Like, that really read to me as her just writing her own little ad copy there. <laughs> um, this also led me to wonder about how Vernon had learned about the Potters. Because obviously Petunia grew up with Lily and knew she was magical from a young age. But Vernon kind of walked into this world. And I wanted to know the story behind that because, I don't know, it's interesting. Um, so I looked it up and um, Ye Olde Pottermore had a nice little story that J.K. Rowling wrote about it. So um, she says that uh, Vernon learned about Petunia's magical connections um, after the two were engaged. Uh, they met through work. Petunia was like an office employee and for some reason 
fell in love with Vernon. <laughs> After they were engaged, Petunia came clean one night in Vernon's quote unquote dark car after a date. It, no, it gets weirder. Um, Vernon, and this is a direct quote, told Petunia solemnly that he would never hold it against her that she had a freak for a sister, and Petunia threw herself upon him in such violent gratitude that he dropped his battered sausage. Battered sausage. That sounds like maybe a corn dog. Yeah, so maybe he was eating a corn dog, but I have a lot of questions about this. Um, that all, I don't know. I read that. And I'm like, this has to be some kind of euphemism here. He dropped his battered sausage. I don't, That's a euphemism. I, I don't know. It just read as weird to me. They're like sitting on a hill overlooking a little like fried food shack in their dark car after a date. I don't know. That reads as... Well, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, I give Vernon a little bit of credit there because he wasn't as big of a jerk as he could have been. The reason I researched this was that, like, picturing this in my brain, if Vernon had heard that from Petunia, I imagine he would have just been like, nope, I'm out, nope, no more. Well, I'm sure when she explained it, she explained it as like, I am completely against this. This is not. Yeah, I mean, the fact that he, he says, like, freak for a sister, and that's like direct Petunia's words. Mm -hmm. um, she definitely did frame it in a very particular way. Yeah, I would love to hear that very slow, drawn out conversation of like. <laughs> so listen, <laughs> I don't know if you know about my sister. <laughs> I've avoided you meeting her for a while, but yep. the wedding's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> there were some other good little tidbits in there, in that Pottermore article, about the wedding. After Petunia told Vernon, um, Petunia and Vernon met with Lily and James uh, before the wedding so that they could all meet each other. It went badly. It says the relationship nosedived from there, as in the relationship between these two couples. What a surprise. It says James was amused by Vernon and made the mistake of showing it. Vernon tried to patronize James, asking what car he drove. James described his racing brew. <laughs> 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 Vernon supposed out loud that wizards had to live on unemployment benefit. James explained about Gringotts and the fortune his parents had saved there in solid gold. <laughs> 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 Vernon could not tell whether he was being made fun of or not and grew angry. The evening ended with Vernon and Petunia storming out of the restaurant while Lily burst into tears and James, a little ashamed of himself, promised to make things up with Vernon at the earliest opportunity. <laughs> It says that they never really made up. The wedding happens and James and Lily were there, but not in any kind of like official capacity. Lily wasn't a bridesmaid. But it does say that Vernon refused to speak to James at the reception, but described him within James's earshot as some kind of amateur magician. <laughs> <laughs> I found all of that hilarious. <laughs> like, I mean, James's comebacks were definitely a little more witty, but Vernon's was... That yeah, was that's, real. That's pretty great. Yeah, I have to give him a little bit of credit for that one. <laughs> On the note of Vernon, we're, we got to talk about Vernon a lot, actually, in this chapter. The whole thing is. Yeah, it's much so Vernon's much about Vermin. Ver Vernon. Vernon. That is a bit of a Freudian slip. So another line that I pulled out um, from the chapter about Vernon was uh, that Vernon was hoping he was imagining things, which he had never hoped before because he didn't approve of imagination. I thought that was interesting when I heard it or when I read it. You could have been listening to the audiobook. No. Okay. I don't, I don't know if they have one. Okay. There is. I okay. think Stephen Fry reads it. I don't know who that is. Okay. You'd know if you heard his voice or at least you'd be like, yeah, I've heard that voice before. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. What was the line again? He hoped he was imagining, uh, which he'd never hoped before because he didn't approve of imagination. Yeah, that, that that would directly coincide with him hating magic and anything weird. Oh, yeah. It's, like, it's to definitely, an extreme extent. It's definitely some solid characterization there. A plus. I, I don't know. It made me laugh. I liked that. No, it was line. definitely an interesting line. Do you have anything else to say about Vernon, Petunia, and the Dursleys? Or can we move on to Dumbledore, McGonagall, and friends? Um, now... Were they hoping their child would have a normal size neck if we've got one without one and one with two? <laughs> yeah, just like, let's hope it balances out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like with me and you, like I'm short and you're like way too tall. So ideally, like it'll balance out. I'm not sure if genetically that's how it works, but we'll see. Yeah. I mean, we'll see. Anything can happen. Yeah, so we'll move on to McGonagall and Dumbledore and all of them, because that's, that's the more fun part of this chapter. Not to say that the Vernon stuff isn't fun, because I think there are some really good lines in there, but the 
Dumbledore McGonagall Hagrid stuff. Unless well, you have more. One last thing would be the the wizard hugging Vernon was that was good. Just great. Yeah, yeah. I like that. <laughs> like he hates everything weird. Uh, he hates strangers, and this weird stranger comes up to him and then hugs him. Have you ever been hugged by a stranger? Yeah, mostly children. But okay, have you ever hugged a stranger? I mean, by the time I'm hugging them, I guess they're not a stranger. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I've never been a big hugger. Like, we don't really hug in my family or have physical contact or affectionate. I'm definitely a hugger. Yeah, you're a good hugger. You give good hugs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, I'm like trying to think of all the people I've hugged in my life, and it's like you and, I don't know, like grandparents. It's a long list. I know. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I've, def- I've definitely hugged strangers. Okay. Well, I hugged um, Moana. At yes. Disney World. Yeah, you did. <laughs> that was weird. Was I, it though? That I felt bad because there I was sweaty. That. Well And I'm like they're there for that and I'm sure they deal with people sweatier than me, but just like I felt bad. Yeah, I mean you should. <laughs> So moving on to Dumbledore and crew, uh, it says that Dumbledore appears so silently you'd have thought he just popped out of the ground. I have a lot of questions here also. Um first, did he apparate? Well, that usually has the loud bang. Exactly. So can Dumbledore apparate without sound? He's impressive. I'd give him that. Yeah. I wrote that we'll have to consult Half-Blood Prince because he apparates a lot in that one with Harry. Uh, And there is another possible explanation that I've seen, but I almost don't want to get into it because it's not going to be introduced for a while. Is it the invisibility cloak? Yeah. Okay. So I do mention the invisibility cloak because that is at least in this book. I feel like it's fair to talk about the invisibility cloak. All right. It's just, it's not going to be introduced for a while. Okay. Um, so my question was just like, did he use James's invisibility cloak, which, you know, we know Dumbledore had, and it says like when Dumbledore leaves that he does so with a swish of his cloak, which backs that up a little bit more for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just flip it back on. Yeah, I guess we can get into kind of the implications of, like, James not having the invisibility cloak at this time. I don't know if that would have changed too much. I mean, it's the invisibility cloak, which, you know, we can get into when we get to Deathly Hallows. So the two of them and a crying baby would have been under it? (laughs) I mean, they could have put, like, Lily and Harry under it, probably. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sure Voldemort would have found them, though. Yeah, probably. I I just thought it was interesting. Yeah. How does Dumbledore get there? Because, you know, we have kind of established rules for how people travel in the magical world, and Dumbledore seems to be able to do it silently. So, it's just interesting. Something. Uh, And another thing to note would just be uh, J.K. Rowling hadn't made up those rules yet. Yeah, and that gets into, like, you know, how much of this did she have worked out? How much of this is... Did she have planned? Which I think a lot, but, you know, she might not have developed the exact rules for apparating and everything. And also the uh, put outer, which was later named the deluminator. And I definitely like deluminator over put outer or silver put outer. I like put outer, except that's an adjustment for me because as a child, my pronunciation of things was never quite right because I did a lot of reading, but I didn't do a lot of talking to other people. (laughs) So, um, you know, I would know these words and I would have ideas in my head about how they were pronounced, but, you know, come to watch like the Harry Potter movies, I would realize "Mm, that wasn't right um, and have to adjust accordingly. And I feel like there's a really good example of that, but I just can't think of it. Is it Accio or Accio? Accio. Accio. Accio brain yeah. yeah i think i was saying asio or something you've been saying asio for a really long time or no it was Asi- i've been saying asio but all yeah. right well still it's wrong yeah but i'm not gonna fault you for that because i've made these mistakes and one of See, them but was- i was making those mistakes after watching the movies and then only reading the books uh did yeah. i start calling it that yeah on the note of the deluminator i used to pronounce that as the putter outer <laughs> well that's just you were reading it wrong yeah So I'm okay with put outer. I know you think that that's a dumb name, but like it's not as dumb as the putter outer. (laughs) But I think the put outer is super cool. I think that that's like a hype moment to start the movie on, which we're not talking in depth about the movie here. And we'll probably do something about the movie at some point when we figure out what we're doing here. (laughs) Exactly. Um, But I the movie starts, correct me if I'm wrong, with Dumbledore 
flicking the lights off. I believe so. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's a great moment to start the movie on. And actually, fun story about the movie. Um, we watched uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, the movie, um, in my second grade classroom. Um, it was like raining one day for recess, and the movie had very recently come out. We had one of those pirated copies of movies that, you know, had probably still were in theaters where some guy just took a video camera and filmed it mm -hmm. and some idiot bought a VHS tape of that <laughs> um, because it was 2002. <laughs> and it was so dark and impossible to see on that TV screen. And, like, I'd already seen the movie in theaters and, like, been in love with it. But I just remember being so frustrated because I couldn't see what was going on. It was just lights and then they go out. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just, I have a vivid memory of that. Also, we watched some weird dinosaur movie with, like, eggs, and I think it was called Dinotopia. There are a lot of dinosaur movies. All right, yeah. Most of them will have eggs in them. Yeah. But, uh... So, listeners, hit me up if you remember Dinotopia. <laughs> yeah, so we were talking about the put-outer. Do you have anything more to say about the put-outer other than you like that it's called the Deluminator instead? It's just a fancier name. Yeah, I'm, it is a much fancier name. I'm it all about the better, common but... folk here. So I think put out her is all. <laughs> well, the way she puts it in that chapter, it almost seems like that was her vaguely explaining it. Yeah, um, that's true. That's a good point. Not necessarily the name of it. Yeah, because if she says deluminator, a six-year-old is going to be like, well, I don't know what that word is. Because mm -hmm. it's not a word. <laughs> no. So Dumbledore appears. He turns off all the lights. Um, Dumbledore's nose is uh, very long and crooked, as though it had been broken at least twice. My question there is, who do you think broke Dumbledore's nose and why? Well, I mean, I know, but... Is there, like, an official yeah, reason Aberfor for that? Aberforth uh, broke his nose in oh. fist fight. Okay. Aberforth is Dumbledore's brother. That's not a spoiler, I don't think. That is. No, that's his name. It's just... Okay, Dumbledore It's just not name. mentioned at all. He has a brother for the next five books. Okay. I don't Sorry. think that's a spoiler. <laughs> I think that's okay. <laughs> um, all right. Well, no, I didn't know that, that it was Aberforth. Well, I'm sure I knew it in some level of my brain, but mm -hmm. it just wasn't at the surface. Well, thing. I mean, it's mentioned specifically he broke it once. So, okay. But if so he broke else? it twice, who else? Yeah. Maybe, I mean, they they were brothers. They could have fought a couple times. Okay. But... Uh, McGonagall says that she must have passed a dozen feasts and parties on my way here. And I want to stop here for a moment to do an imaginative exercise and picture Professor McGonagall at a party. No. <laughs> Maybe as the cat. <laughs> She's the party cat. <laughs> yeah. She'll hang out by the punch bowl until she gets drunk enough to uh, change back into a human, do some dancing. I don't know about that. <laughs> well, I mean, 10 years ago before... Oh, before ten. she lost her figure. <laughs> <laughs> well, 10 years before um, the rest of the book starts, maybe she'd be a little looser. Yeah, she was actually pretty young, a little looser. What? Well, <laughs> not as uptight. And you yelled at me for the battered sausage. <laughs> All right, maybe we should move on. <laughs> maybe. In the interest of being child friendly, which has disintegrated. <laughs> Again, we can edit. <laughs> I stand by that interpretation. <laughs> Uh, let's see, I got another quote. Uh, Dumbledore says to McGonagall, you flatter me, said Dumbledore calmly. Voldemort had powers I will never have. And McGonagall responds, only because you're too, well, noble to use them. I think this is important for a lot of reasons. Um, important because of what we later learn about Dumbledore's past, which we're not going to get into. I gotta try to watch myself there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, within the context of Philosopher's Stone, I think that the word and, or at least the idea of, uh, being noble shows up quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, it and Bravery, I think, are just kind of reoccurring characteristics that show up in the series that Rowling definitely places a lot of stock in. That, um, sure, at some point Harry is described as noble, at some point he is definitely described as brave, and I like that idea of nobility in these books, that, like, being good is a matter of nobility. It's about not about, you know, just adhering to the good here. Mm -hmm. It's about, you know, knowing the good and the bad and having that power and using it right and using it well and using it nicely. Yeah, it's not just obeying the rules. It's... Yeah, yeah, which definitely begins to loom large within the series. So I think that this quote is really cool for introducing that kind of theme very early on. Yeah. Yeah, whether it's intentional or not. Uh, Dumbledore says to McGonagall, the owls are nothing next to the rumors that are flying around. I think that's an awesome pun. It flew by me. <laughs> <laughs> that's horrible. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> um, yeah, that just made me laugh. Um, and I think this is a good time to once again consult Galadriel about the etymology of Dumbledore's name. His first name, Albus, is Latin for white, a tribute to his silvery hair and beard. According to a JKR interview with Lindsay Fraser in Conversations with J.K. Rowling, his last name comes from an Old English word, bumblebee, which JKR said that she chose because she likes to think of him as always on the move, humming to himself. I like that picture. Yeah, that's kind of adorable. Yeah, I think that's cute. Um, And because I don't have another good point in my notes to bring this up, I'm going to toss McGonagall's etymology in there as well. Um, Once again, from Galadriel, our best friend. For Minerva McGonagall's name, JKR uses alliteration. You should know what that is. Minerva is the Roman name for Athena, the Greek goddess of learning, wisdom, war, and crafts. That sums her up nicely. It fits. Uh, Athena also just happens to have a famed reputation for morphing herself and others into clever disguises. Her symbols are the owl and the olive tree. We can assume that Minerva McGonagall is intelligent and a formidable opponent, and she is likely to be proud of her clan. Uh, The clan thing comes in with McGonagall, which, of course, has Scottish roots. And um, if I've learned anything from Highlander, it's that Scottish people are all about Scotland and their clan. Okay. Yeah. No, but we definitely see that in, um, you know, her loyalty to Gryffindor, that she she loves Gryffindor. That McGonagall's pretty no-nonsense, except when it comes to Quidditch, which she's also pretty no-nonsense about in terms of you better win. (laughs) I feel like she was so excited when she met Oliver Wood. Because she's just like, finally, somebody who gets it. <laughs> that Quidditch is all that matters. Yeah, and that's very important as the head of the house or whatever. She, I mean, whatever yeah. Whatever the title is. Yeah, she's the head yeah, of house. Head of house, um, okay. But, like, you see that in Snape, too. But that's also because Snape is not a good person. And I think that he just wants Slytherin to win so that everybody else is sad and We'll get into Snape. But then, like, Professor Sprout, you don't see her, like, big into Quidditch. She's the Hufflepuff head of house. And uh, Flitwick is the Ravenclaw head of house. And he's never, I think, mentioned in context of Quidditch. I mean, Slytherin is the only one that matters in the first, like, three books. And kind of in all the books. (laughs) But then also, you don't really hear uh, McGonagall talking about Quidditch in her classroom. No, and but that's it's... the only time uh, okay. Harry's interacting with the other two teachers. Okay, I guess that's true. Yeah, that maybe uh, Flitwick is like riling up Cho Chang to catch the snitch. Yeah, I think we're getting a little too ahead of ourselves. Yeah, maybe, for but chapter it's one. not. It's not a spoiler though. So. I just... All right. Okay, back to the chapter. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dumbledore talks a little bit about his reasons for dropping um, Harry at the Dursleys because McGonagall objects to it. Understandably, um, it says. It would be enough to turn any boy's head. Famous before he can walk and talk. Famous for something he won't even remember. Can't you see how much better off he'll be growing up away from all that until he's ready to take it? So ostensibly, he's saying that um, he's leaving Harry with the Dursleys because he wants to make sure that Harry doesn't grow up to be a braggart. Okay. But... I mean, it makes sense. It would definitely go to Harry's head. And knowing Harry's character later on... Adding that yeah. extra ego, like, for his entire life. Sure, but he he must know how badly the Dursleys are going to treat this kid. Like, and this has been a point of contention in the fandom. Like, how dare Dumbledore leave Harry there to be abused and, like, to be aware of this abuse and, you know, just be like, well, it's good for his, like, upbringing. It's well, on top him a of man. that, there was the, um, that spell cast on kind of the house yeah so uh, there's like, like protection there's other reasons here family. but this is the reason we're getting in the chapter stick to the chapter yeah, Joe. i'm so sorry <laughs> um this is the reason we're getting in the chapter that like you and like that's fine but like i don't know that's just it makes me a little uncomfortable <laughs> I know, I know the story couldn't happen without it, that it's necessary. It's just like... I mean, it could. It would just be different. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's an interesting point. It gives him like a humble beginning. Yes. It fits in with the hero's journey, which we'll talk about because I love Joseph Campbell. And also, uh, he might have been hunted in the wizard world. Yes. Yes. There are a lot of reasons to do it. It's just that like, this is the one that Dumbledore cites. <laughs> Like, not like, oh, he might be in danger because there are still Death Eaters <laughs> who might be mad that Voldemort is no longer here. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's just kind of interesting. McGonagall says of Hagrid that you can't pretend he's not careless. I think that that's an important little bit. But of, he's good hearted. He is good hearted. I love Hagrid. But a lot of this book depends on Hagrid being 
careless. careless yes. <laughs> but it's so sweet. I think I, th- I love the relationship between Dumbledore and Hagrid ignoring that Dumbledore is like, Hey, come work for me and live in this little shack because that's like the perfect situation for Hagrid. But like, there is some weird classist stuff going on in there. Yeah. But I love the relationship between Dumbledore and Hagrid. I think that it's adorable. And I love that line of McGonagall saying like, you trusted Hagrid with this. And Dumbledore just says like, I would trust Hagrid with my life. Yeah. Like, I love that. I think that's adorable. And I think Hagrid's adorable. I oh, love yeah, Hagrid. I love Hagrid. Um, but speaking of Hagrid, when Hagrid uh, lands on Sirius Black's motorbike, which I, I like that they mentioned Sirius there. We'll get into Sirius. In a while. In a while. But um, I, I like <laughs> Give that. Give it a year or two. <laughs> I like that little bit of continuity there. Um, so Sirius lands on... Um, Hagrid lands on Sirius's motorbike with uh, baby Harry in tow. And Rowling describes Hagrid as you're supposed to do when you introduce a character and says his feet were in their leather boots like baby dolphins. How big is a baby dolphin? I That's like, not that seems my like... question. <laughs> I want to know why baby dolphins. What about Hagrid's feet is a like a baby dolphin? In their leather, leather boots. It's some dolphin leather right there. Oh, I didn't think... He wears dolphin leather. <laughs> <laughs> Hagrid dresses exclusively in dolphin leather. I don't know. It's just like... He just like sips up the fin and sort of ties them. It's really uncomfortable to picture baby dolphins in boots and Hagrid on top of them. <laughs> well, obviously that's not what she meant, but... I don't know. I don't, they were just, you know... That was one of those lines that I'm big. just like, did I read that correctly? It, Are it baby dolphins large? Are baby dolphins known for being large enough that this line makes sense? Well, that's the weirdest part about it. It's like there's I couldn't exactly tell you how big a baby dolphin is supposed to be. I'm guessing like two feet. But that's a complete guess. That's a mildly educated guess. But you understand why this is unnecessary. Not like, well, sure. Like, you know, better. use similes. Go ahead. But baby dolphins. I got nothing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't I just, I, I mean, no, you don't need to have an answer to that. <laughs> There's no possible answer to that. It's just, yeah. So they drop baby Harry on the porch and <laughs> Dumbledore says, well, that's that. <laughs> and then they just leave him on the porch until the next morning. <laughs> yeah. And in their defense, they stand there for a full minute but it really is pretty quick. Like, you know, thinking about that comic where Dumbledore literally throws Harry on the doorstep and says, it's dropped. Yeah. It re- like it resembles that more than I'm comfortable with. Yeah. I mean, especially as a baby. Yeah. Like, like let's leave a baby out in the cold because it's November 1st. Yeah. In England. <laughs> <laughs> He's got his blanket. Yeah. He, he'll survive. Of course. But. <laughs> <laughs> there are some questionable decisions going on. And he's on here. just hoping that Vernon's not going out the door first without yeah, looking to like down. step on the baby. Yeah. yeah. What if the milkman comes and sees like, hey guys, you got a baby here? Like the neighbors in this community spy on each other constantly, and there's a baby on the porch. <laughs> Good thing it was sleeping soundly. Yeah. My uh, sister used to tell me that I was left on the porch as a child and they felt bad for me. So they took me in. I think your sister was just cruel. (laughs) It's because I don't look like any of them. And that was a a point of mocking for us as children. You look exactly like your grandma, though. I know, but like, I don't look like my sisters or my mother. Yeah, you kind of do, though. Uh, but yeah, that's something that was said. It was that was definitely some bullying influenced by Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> this is my last note for Gladriel. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Privet Drive, which is a, a pretty important setting, I think. Um, and we talked about how like Petunia spying on the neighbors and how this is a weird, a weird place. But um, talking about the etymology of Privet Drive, uh, Gladriel writes. I I love that. I love saying Gladriel. <laughs> I know. You um, let's see. Privet means an ornamental shrub, which perfectly describes the appearance of the neatly pruned hedge lined street, which they do actually think say the word neat hedges or something at some point in this chapter. Yeah, and, I think so. And, and Rowling has backed up that connection. But uh, also, however, in French, which uh, Rowling taught, 
Privet would be pronounced like privé. Don't know French very well, so that. It's probably wrong. Privé in French means confidential or private life, which makes sense. The root private, privet, um, you know, something went on there to make it that, but it's fun. Yeah. Fun facts. Um, this is something that I missed writing down in my notes, but I'm going to add in anyway. It's about Dumbledore. He has a little scar over his left knee. McGonagall says, like, you know, can we do anything about the scar on Harry's forehead? Is it really worth it for him to grow up marked? Um, and Dumbledore says, like, hey, scars can be useful. I have one above my left knee. That's a perfect map of the London Underground, which is a great little detail. And also, what is Dumbledore doing on the London Underground? Well, we do see him there <laughs> later, much later. Oh, yeah. But uh, other than that, <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes you just you're a wizard lost in the city. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get around somehow. <laughs> but on the note of scars, uh, Gladriel says, it should be noted that the famous Odysseus, um, Ulysses, of Greek mythology fame also had a scar just abo above his knee, and he used it to identify him as the legitimate king upon his return home from the Trojan War. So the left knee connection, I, I think, is probably connected with the Dumbledore thing and picking the place to put that scar, especially considering that Rowling studied uh, classics, which are mythology. Um, classics in college. Um, so I definitely think that that left knee thing is related, but I also think that that story of him using it to identify himself uh, upon returning to um, his home relates to Harry, kind of. You know, that's the moment, um, you know, people see the scar and they're like, oh my God, it's Harry Potter. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah, so I, I think that's an interesting little connection there too that Gladriel draws for us. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Gladriel. Um, so that's all my notes for this chapter, unless you have anything that I missed or anything you wanted to bring up. Well, there's... Hagrid's relationship with Harry already. Yeah. You yeah, that's a sweet little sad thing. to let him go. Because Hagrid just has such a big heart. You know, he's a big guy with a big heart. Yes, definitely. And big trash can sized hands. Yeah, that was, I'm like, all right, okay. Like, that's at least something that's within the realm of experience for people, the size of trash can lids, but... But not baby dolphins. Ba not baby dolphins. <laughs> Um, yeah, but the Hagrid thing is really sweet. Just the idea of him, you know, flying around with little baby Harry and taking care of him after this horrific thing just happened to him and being exactly the kind of person that someone would need after going through something horrible like that. Yeah. And that I think that's definitely mirrored later on in the book when Hagrid comes and picks up Harry from yeah, the Yeah, to bring him to Hogwarts. Hogwarts. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so cute. I love it. I have such a soft spot in my heart for characters like Hagrid in the Harry Potter series, especially Molly Weasley. And we'll definitely talk mm -hmm. a lot about Molly Weasley, but I have a huge spot in my heart for characters like Hagrid and Molly Weasley that just accept Harry as family, like in an instant and just give him that love and affection that he never received as a child. But talking about the chapter as a whole, do you think that it's a satisfying lead into the series? I think it definitely introduces the setting without giving anything away. Yeah, it's interesting, too, because Harry is, you know, in a book that's named Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Harry is barely in it. Yeah, he's definitely not speaking yet. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting, too, because um, for the most part, the Harry Potter books everything in there is Harry, 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 Harry. Like, Harry is directly involved in everything. And more importantly, it's from his perspective for yes. the rest of the book. Yes, which I'm sure we'll pick up on things about that. But the first chapter of the books, I want to say every single book fits this. It's not really about Harry. There are different settings and different characters and a different perspective for them. Definitely for some of them. I don't remember all of them. I, I couldn't sit here and list them, and we're not going to do that because, again, you know, spoilers, we're trying not to do that. But um, it is definitely a recurring pattern yes. with the with the books. Um, so, yeah, I think that it is a really good lead in. Um, like you said, it kind of presents the setting that there's this line between the real grounded world that we're used to. And then the magical world where people have feet like baby dolphins and people turn <laughs> into cats and stuff like that. Um, and I think that it has a good level of like mystery and intrigue with the way that the chapter ends. That, you know, they drop Harry and... Um, and they just all go their separate ways. They go their separate ways and you're left to wonder like, okay, you know, how do these characters come back into Harry's life? What happens to Harry? I think there are a lot of really good questions that keep you moving throughout the series because that's something that we have to be aware of that this is children's literature and it can be hard to get children to read. So a book like Harry Potter that gives that kind of like taste of what's to come and really kind of propels them along, I think is really great. And I think it's a 
great job on Rowling's part and a reason, you know, one of the many reasons that these books are so beloved. And also that whole chapter, they didn't once say wizard or Hogwarts. Really? Yeah. I, I mean, I believe the Hogwarts bit, but I didn't know wizard. That's interesting. Yeah. I guess it makes sense because, you know, the Dursleys aren't going to say the word wizard. They're going to say like weirdos or freaks or stuff like that. And, you know, it's not like Dumbledore is going to be like, hello, I'm a wizard. <laughs> when amongst other wizards. Yeah. Anything else that I missed that you want to talk about with this chapter? No, not that I can think of. All right. So I guess that concludes our discussion of chapter one, The Boy Who Lived. Uh, we lived through it. No, nope, we're cutting that out. <laughs> nope, I have the control. It's happening. You can't leave nope, that in there. It's staying. Uh, yeah, that wraps up a discussion of The Boy Who Lived. So there are a lot of ways that we're going to encourage everybody to communicate with us throughout this process. Um, the first and probably the easiest is we're soliciting emails from you all. Um, you can send us uh, corrections or expand on something that we brought up that we just don't have the knowledge or the Google foo to discover on our own. You can ask us questions. Google foo? Google foo, like Kung Fu. Except you never heard that before? Not at all. No. Okay. Well, um, you can ask us questions either about like our reactions to certain things or, you know, little details that you can't figure out by just Googling it. There's a lot of there on Google. We're not very smart. Speak for yourself. Yeah. Well, you can ask us questions, correct us on things, or just share some of your experiences or reactions. Um, maybe help us out with that baby dolphins thing <laughs> because I really <laughs> want to believe that there's a reason for that. Um, yeah. So please email us. Um, our email address is owlpost at podtrificustotalis.com, O-W-L-P-O-S-T at P-O-D-T-R-I-F-I-C-U-S-T-O-T-A-L-U-S, owlpost at podtrificustotalis.com. Maybe we'll read some of them on future episodes. I don't know. We haven't figured that out yet because we don't have emails yet because we just started this. Um, but yeah, yeah it might somebody, take a couple episodes. Uh, no, I believe that. But if somebody sends us something particularly illuminating, I would want to share that on the podcast. Yeah, um, so if you're not comfortable with that, please, you know, just leave us a little note that says, like, I'd rather not have this on the podcast or at least rather not have your name mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. You can, we can do it anon anonymously and I'm not expecting such a volume of emails that I'm not going to be able to say like, Hey, do you mind if I mention this on the podcast? Um, but yeah, we'll at least read and hopefully reply to everything that you guys send, even if we don't read it on the air. Yeah. Please talk to us. I think that the Harry Potter series is awesome and it's meant to be shared. And that's why we're doing this podcast. Mm -hmm. Then of course, you know, we do have social media because it's 2017. Um, so we are on Twitter at podtrificus, P O D, T-R-I-F-I-C-U-S. If you search Podtrificus Totalis, we'll show up too. It's just they have a character limit for Twitter handles. Um, and we're on the Facebooks. You can search us Podtrificus Totalis. No, um, I don't like that either. Well, don't say the Facebook. I'm going to say the Facebooks. Uh, Tumblr, we're on there as well. And uh, we have a website, podtrificustotalis.com, um, where we'll post um, the episodes of course, um, we'll leave some detailed show notes about maybe some of the things that we talked about, links to maybe the Pottermore readings that we've done, uh, that kind of thing, and other fun little goodies. Yeah, and if we ever come up with a schedule of when these will be released... <laughs> Uh, we'll definitely have that up there. Yes, that's important information to share. Um, because this is a podcast, you can find it on pretty much any podcast distribution, iTunes, Pocket Casts, whatever podcast app that you're on. We'll make sure that we're on there, too, so that you can subscribe to us and get the episodes as soon as possible. Um, if there's a particular podcast service that you use that we're not on, email us about that, too, and I'll take care of it. But I'm pretty good at this, so we'll... We'll be there. <laughs> uh, yeah, so thank you everyone for listening um, and uh, sharing this experience with us. And you can join us next time for our discussion of Chapter 2. The Vanishing Glass. 